This is Sheila's Take, a podcast where you can hear my take on everything. Love, hate, relationships, family, and today's issues with a godly perspective. I'm your host, Sheila Dunbar. Thank you for joining me. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Sheila's Take. And today, I want you guys to meet Bob D. Pasquale. He is a purpose-driven impact maker who firmly believes in the power of making positive differences in our world. Bob's life took an unexpected turn when at the age of 18, he was diagnosed with cancer, just days before the tragic events of September 11, 2001. The physical healing happened miraculously within just four months, but the mental recovery took years. It was during this journey that Bob realized the significance of his battle with cancer and the losses his family endured during 9-11. Now Bob's mission is to inspire others to find the silver linings amidst tragedy and utilize their unique gifts to uplift, uplift those in need. So get ready to be inspired as we dive into Bob's incredible journey and learn how his experiences have shaped the lives of others. Bob, welcome to Sheila's Take. How are you? I'm wonderful, Sheila. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, the mission of your show, yeah. very, very well aligned with what I like talking about. So this would be a good one. Good, good. Um, now, I, I know a little bit about your background, but uh, tell me, how did your diagnosis with cancer and the events of September 11th impact your perspective on life? Wow, that's a deep question, and I, if I'm being honest, I don't know if I can fully answer it yet, because mm-hmm. those those events in my life, Sheila, I think about them every single day, and that's not an exaggeration, and we, you know, we'll probably get into a few stories as we record today, uh, and I will not exaggerate about anything, and I will definitely not exaggerate that on a daily basis, I think about that time in my life, and uh, the way that it has affected me more recently is it has driven me to use my gifts and skills Mm -hmm. uh, to make the world a better place and to help other people and other organizations build cultures of generosity because I I truly believe that it was generosity, not just medical advances in technology and not just my own determination to recover from an illness in such a terrible time in our nation's history. Uh, But I it was also the generosity of the people around me that helped me recover and ultimately have helped me really get through the past 20 years. So it's really been quite a journey. So uh, that's how it's done so far. And, I, and I'd be happy to keep, to report back in the next decade once it, once it happens. Well, why don't you like just explain exactly mm-hmm. what's happening? Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, can, I, can I start with a question? I like to start with a question. Okay, sure. Right. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt invincible like you just fell on top of the world nothing could take you down yes yeah you've been there and i I would assume most people listening do and a lot of humans have that feeling from time to time in life and most of us have it especially when you're a young man you have it when you're a teenager and you think like you have your whole life in front of you and you can do just about anything and you're indestructible Mm -hmm. and that was me at age 18 sheila i was the kid i was i wouldn't call myself risky or a daredevil but i was just very very confident in my ability to get things done i didn't have a right. problem taking risks and so uh i guess you could call a small risk in my life at the time was when i graduated high school i, I lived i grew up in south florida since i was three years old i was actually born in new york mm-hmm. and i moved down here and i still live here to this day into South Florida, but I wanted to do something for college that was different than just South Florida. It, although I love it here, I love the weather, I love the people, I love the culture and diversity, but I wanted to do something different. And I had an opportunity to go up to Hofstra University, which is on Long Island, New York. I know exactly. I know that exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so you know Hofstra, you probably know Hempstead. and you. I know it. I know it. I used to live there. I used to live in Hempstead. Oh, really? Oh, wow. That's great. So, so we might have been neighbors. Uh, mm-hmm. So I was there for four years. Well, my freshman year, I was like, well, this is a great opportunity. I can go up to New York. I can play football because I had an opportunity to play football there. I can see a lot of my family and my cousins, aunts and uncles that I just never really spent that much time with because I grew up in South Florida. And then somewhere in that mix was an education. I'm sure my parents probably will hope that it was at the top of the list, <laughs> but uh, it was on the list. Nonetheless, though, I thought, man, this is, I felt so blessed. I have such an awesome opportunity in life to do those three things and, mm-hmm. and be that 18 year old kid, super confident. So I went off to college. And, you know, you asked how this whole thing happened. I mean, it's a long story, but it's worth telling because 
uh, you know, I didn't, it's like nothing you could ever expect when you're an 18-year-old going off to college. So a training camp in college for football is a lot different than anyone who maybe has, you know, has played has played in high school football or other levels, but uh, it's about a month long. And back then the rules were less strict than they are now. And it was a really, really challenging thing. I mean, we would practice two and three times a day, be up early in the morning, to bed late at night, lifting weights, practicing, watching film, watching more film, chalk talk, you know, all the things you need to do to be a good college football player. And so it's very, very taxing on the body. But pretty early on in training camp, I came up lame with what I thought was a groin injury. Mm -hmm. And my, my next question for you and the audience and anyone out there is, have you ever pulled a groin muscle before? And I hadn't to that point in my life. Yeah. And I thought it was the most debilitating thing in the world. I mean, you think, okay, a groin muscle, it's not your quad, your hamstring, or your, you know, it's not like a main muscle, but yeah, you can't sit, stand, twist, bend over. I mean, it's a very, very debilitating injury. And so mentally that was really taxing on me because I was trying to prove myself to my new coaches, to my new right. teammates. You know, I'm a little freshman kid from Florida trying to prove myself. And so Sheila, I would do this rehab exercise where at early in the morning in training camp, I would sit on this three-wheeled stool and I would shimmy ac for, across this massive training room, you know, that had like 50 to 100 people in it on any given morning. And I suppose part of the exercise was to strengthen like the muscle in my hips and that area of the body as I kind of pushed this stool across the floor. And I was doing it for like almost a week. And I was like, that might get any better, you know? And one day our head trainer, who was a small guy, you know, like five, six, 120, 30 pounds soaking wet. And in order to get everyone's attention, because it was so loud and boisterous early in the morning when everyone was getting treatment and getting ready for practice, he would stand on this box. And I remember him like cupping his hands and screaming my name, Bobby. They called me Bobby back then. Bobby, quit being a weakling and get back out on the field. Like you got to go practice. And right, I'm like, right. And I'm like, oh, come on. The head trainers call me out. I feel like such a loser. <laughs> and uh, I ended up having a more serious conversation with him. And he said, you know what? You're not getting any better. And I'm like, yeah, obviously. And he sends me to the doctor. Now, I'm an 18-year-old, so I'm, technically I'm an adult. Right. right? Because, of, you know, by age. Mm -hmm. So for about a week, I or maybe almost two weeks, I'm driving around Long Island like every every day, going to all these different doctor's appointments ultrasounds, CAT scans, sonograms, MRIs, every test in the book will try to figure out what's going on. And, you know, you go into the doctor's office and I had to fill out a step. This is not digital, you know, the little tablet. Yeah, that I know. You got all those, pa all those papers. Yes. I don't even you know, know that. that. I don't know the answers to the, I don't know what my insurance numbers are. I don't even know what insurance is. I'm 18. <laughs> like, so I fill out all this information, you know, trying to call my parents, get help. So I'd be in these appointments for hours. I mean, it's not fun, like boring. Like definitely not my vision of what my first month of college would look like. Right. So I'll never forget this, though. The day that my parents were coming up for my first ever game, this was towards the end of training camp, so it was a Thursday. Now, we knew I wasn't playing in the game at this point because I was injured or something went wrong. Mm -hmm. But I had this appointment, and typically these appointments would take hours, but this one went abnormally fast. I mean, I walked into the office. It's like they were waiting for me to beat it. It's like... It was almost like they expected me to walk through the door at the moment. They called me right back. Right. And my parents were supposed to fly up that morning. And so I go into the appointment and and the doctor sits me down. He's, he's in the office 30 seconds after I get in the office. So I didn't have to wait very long for him either. And he sits me down and looks me dead in the eye. And he says, Bobby, you have cancer. And I mean... I was flabbergasted. I mean, my, my jaw hit the desk. I probably yeah. had a white stare on. And he looked at me and he says, I know you're probably panicked or you don't know what to say right now. Don't worry. We're going to hook you up with an oncologist. You're free to go. And that was it. Wow. <laughs> you're free to go. Like That's what he said to me. And I, wow. I was in shock. Total shock. So I walked out of the office and my parents had landed already. And it was like, I mean, she was like divine timing. I can't even explain it. Mm -hmm. I get out of this building, this strange building in like the middle of nowhere. I have no idea where I'm at. And my phone rings and it's my mom. And she goes, oh, hey, you know, I knew you had your appointment. I expected you to be in there a few hours, but we landed. I'm just going to leave a message and letting you know we're on our way in the car to your uncle's house, which is my mom's brother where they were going to be staying. And she goes, but, but while I have you, how'd the appointment go? 
And I was like, uh, about that appointment, mom, <laughs> let me tell you what the doctor said. And I tell you, Sheila, I mean, I had to tell her what he said and it was like she was screaming, but it was dead silent on the other end of the phone. I can't even describe to you. I can imagine as a mother hearing that. Yeah. Eerie, eerie silence. And mm -hmm. the only thing I remember hearing is my dad screaming. Like he was on the other, must have been in the other seat in the car, you know, in the back seat with her. And I could hear him like yelling, like, Susan, Susan, which is my mom's name. Like, what's wrong? Like, even he knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And she was saying nothing. And so, uh, we we met back at my uncle's house where, where they were going to be staying, and uh, I mean I, I I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> I hadn't been away from home that long ever in my life, and uh, you know so like a month. And my I mean we gave each other big hugs and mm -hmm. said some prayers and shed some tears, but it was I mean it was an incredibly emotional time for me to get uh, or, and way for me to be diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, and I'll continue the story, but at that point it was already pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even the fact of how how that like, people just told you. I mean, I can't even imagine that yeah. picking up by yourself, an eighteen year old, hearing that, and then okay, you can go. That that would have that's scary right there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank God your parents were were there, you know, so that you mm -hmm. you, you had them to to lean on during that time. I mean that that I, that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It. And I, you know, now that I think about it, it could have been, they probably could have even have been more taxing if my parents, if they had diagnosed me before my parents got there. So right. it was, it was very, very taxing. So uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, we're talking about generosity and, and, and the things that went really well in my life at that point, my, my uncles, so my, my female cousin, we'll get to my male cousin in a moment, but my female cousin, my uncle's daughter, her, one of her best friends, and she was like in second grade at the point was an oncologist and he ended up you know, kind of bending over backwards at his clinic to be able to, to serve me and to take me in and to treat me. So we oh. spoke with him right away. I think the next day we spoke with him and um, he had already started laying out like tests and treatment plans and things. And he told me one thing though, that I'll never forget the day. He said, don't drop out of your classes. Like if I'm going to treat you, you're staying in New York. You're not going home to Florida. Okay. And I don't want you, I don't want you to have nothing to do. So don't drop out of your classes. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that was Friday. Then Saturday, my uncle's best friend comes over his house. Now, we don't know this guy. So this is, this is critical to the story, Sheila. My uncle's best friend comes over. Never met him. I mean, he, he lives in New York, and we live in Florida, right? And so he comes into the house. He says hi to my aunt and uncle, and he walks, like, directly over to my parents as if he knew them, which he didn't. And he puts his hand in his pocket, and, and he reaches out. And it looked like he was almost, like, punching my parents, but he, like, shoved his keys in their face. And he aggressively said, Bob, Susan, I can't imagine what you're going through with your son right now, but take my keys. You can have my car for as long as you need it. And he handed them my keys and they were, like, they were silent. I mean, they didn't know what to say. And I thought to myself, wow, that's the most generous thing mm -hmm. that someone's ever done for my family and I. And he, you, you didn't know him? You, you no. got, wow. I mean, he knew my uncle really well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, yeah. Didn't know us. Didn't know me from Adam. And so, and he was there. I mean, he was there for maybe 15 minutes. Sheila. I mean, he's right after that, he said a few words, you know, said goodbye to my aunt and uncle and he left. And I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> and my uncle was like, oh, that's Tim, man. He's a, you know, he's a really nice guy. You know, he's, he's known for mm -hmm. being generous. And I didn't really think anything of it beyond that. I, that was it at the moment. I was like, you know, just all the whirlwind of stuff going on. I was just, I couldn't even believe what was happening. So fast forward now a couple of days. That that day was actually our, my Hofstra's first game that season. Mm -hmm. So I remember listening to it on the radio and trying to listen to that and then all this stuff going through my head. It was just a crazy weekend. So, But the next week comes and I went to my first class on Monday, used Tim's car, went to some doctor's appointments. Tuesday morning comes now and I went to my second ever college class. And I remember coming out of this class and being kind of hungry. So I went over to the cafeteria and I got a breakfast burrito. And I'm sitting at, I think it was like a you know, a little like high top bar type of deal. Mm -hmm. I'm eating the burrito and I'm watching the news. Now, once again, I'm 18. You know, I don't really watch the news and I don't even know the TV stations in New York. So whatever's on this like little eight inch tube television, that's, mm -hmm. you know, those TVs in public places that used to like hang on a bracket between the yeah. wall this, and the yeah. ceiling. 
<laughs> so I'm like squinting, you know, I have 18 year old healthy eyes, but I'm like squinting to watch TV, but I, I'm paying attention. And all of a sudden there's a plane crashes into a building. You know, I'm like, oh no, all right, that's a terrible accident. Like how horrible is that? So I actually called my dad and I said, hey dad, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm grabbing something to eat. I'll be, I'll be back to, to uncle's house in just a bit, but are you watching the news? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm watching. I just saw that that accident. I was like, yeah, that's terrible. And we were talking for like maybe a minute. And then, bam, it's like another plane. Right. Hit a right. tower there. We realized, wow, that's an attack on right. Twin Towers in, in Manhattan. And September 11th was happening at that moment. And it was like, oh, my goodness. I can't even believe this is going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my, uncle, my, my dad was like, you know, you better get back to your uncle's house now. Like, this is not normal. It was so, I that breakfast burrito is probably still sitting there. She, I mean, I sprinted out of that <laughs> building. I mean, the groin injury suddenly healed. You know, like I just, <laughs> I out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ah man, I took off, and uh, I got in the car, and it was typically a fifteen minute drive from hospital to my uncle's house. Mm -hmm. But it took me nine hours. Where was you? Where Where was it? Where was your uncle? He wasn't. Was he not in Long Island? He was just someplace else. No, no. So I'll I'll get to it. So that's oh. another critical part of the story. So. Um, my aunt was home with the kid, you know, with my cousins and the pets and everything and my mom and dad. And, uh, subsequently after all this happened, I, I got a master's degree in broadcast journalism when I actually worked in AM radio and I loved it, but most people don't listen to AM radio anymore. And even if you do, I doubt someone would listen to nine straight hours of it, but I listened to the entire broadcast on AM radio of what was happening in September 11th and, you know, burning towers way in the distance like watching it all happen listening to it in the in the chaos on the highway mm -hmm. and it was just nuts and thankfully i made it off the highway before i actually ran out of gas and it was in my uncle's neighborhood that my car stopped and i was like oh my goodness i can imagine if i would have lost the if i would have ran out of gas on the highway forget about it now wow yeah so we pushed my car into the driveway and uh, you know my parents were there and we kind of looked at each other like, man, like I was questioning my own existence just a couple of days ago. Now I'm questioning the existence of the world. Like yeah. what is happening right now? Yeah. So my aunt was panicking though, because you asked about my uncle and he was on business the night before and he was supposed to fly home that morning to Manhattan and we couldn't get a hold of him. Mm. Finally at like, I don't know, 7, 7.30 PM or so he calls. He says, hey, guys, just want to let you know I'm okay. I'm really sorry. I've been trying to get through all day, but the phones have been out. I'm stuck in Denver. I saw what, what happened, uh, but I'm okay. I'm going to try to catch a flight tomorrow. And we were talking for a few minutes, and we were getting ready to hang up the phone. But he was like, hey, but just real quick, before I let you go, I wanted to tell you that uh, Tim, who you all met just a couple of days ago, he was in the tower this morning, and he died. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. And... It was like, you know, it just hits you like a ton of bricks. You're like, wait, Tim, you mean the guy who just gave us and his car? Oh, wow. And we we couldn't believe it. And so, well, it turns out that Tim worked for an investment banking firm called Cantor Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. If you know anyone who's in the investment industry would, would definitely yeah. have heard of that before. And they had offices there in one of the towers. And their entire staff that morning uh, perished except... Their leader, Howard Lutnick, who has one of the most emotional press conferences you will ever see. It's on YouTube. You can search it. You can you know, search CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald 9-11 press conference. And he was uncharacteristically out of the office that morning. Like he would usually be like the first guy there. But his wife was busy or something and he had to take the kids to school. And he was one of those people that were running down the street when the building started collapsing. Like and he survived and uh, it's just him talking about losing his whole staff is just, oh, incredible. So Tim was, Tim was one of those people on the staff there. And, um, Canterford Shelby was known for being super generous. In fact, they would donate office space to my uncle's foundation for cystic fibrosis, which is a disease that my other cousin has, who I, who I mentioned a, a moment ago. And they were so generous of giving that office space to them. And luckily everyone from the foundation wasn't typically in the office that early, Except for Tammy, who was kind of the, uh, you know, the lead organizer of everything over there at the time. And she actually got stuck in the subway underneath the tower that day and survived. Okay. But, you know, Sheila, the stories that she can tell are just yeah. incredible. But it makes you wonder. So Tammy was saved. Uh, but for some reason, Tim was not. And uh, 
it really hits me every day, like I mentioned before. But Tim was known for being this generous guy. And you know how people talk about FOMO, fear of missing out, or YOLO, yeah. we live once. They have all these yeah. crazy acronyms thrown around yeah. there. Well, Tim would talk about, apparently, that you only you never know when your last opportunity to be generous to someone will be. And it just yeah. turns out that his last opportunity to be generous to someone, he took advantage of it, took advantage of it and it was for our family. Wow. 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 That's amazing. That, 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 that's a very, uh, amazing story. It, it it really is. It's very inspiring. And that's where you, that's where you got the, um, the idea or the passion to do the same. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. The question you ask, I've been asked it in many different ways over the years. And I think the best way I can describe it is that planted a seed Mm -hmm. uh, in me and it took other episodes and things and contemplation and prayer and, you know, just experiences in my life to really germinate the seed and grow it. And now, you know, now I'm hopefully planting others, Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, without that period of time and what Tim did for us, you know, I don't think I would have, and it was, I mean, I can't tell you how helpful that was because throughout the next couple of months, Tim's car basically was critical and, and because we couldn't get around in New York. We had to go into New York City a couple of days after the attacks so I can get treatment and Really? I have to I have I have funny stories. I have sad stories. I have, you know, deep stories. I have child I mean I got everything of all of the next couple of weeks and months of things that happened. And most of it all happened because I was able to get there because of Tim and his car. Now, could we have gotten there some other way and maybe but the convenience that it provided for us and the option to go to multiple clinics to get different tests done and really make the best decisions for my treatment uh, is really owed to Tim and his family. And so, um, you know, that period of time definitely carved a little, little spot in my heart or my, my mind that I'm always, that I'm going to dive deeper into why and how uh, people should be generous. And, and I've done that since. And, you know, I, I had an incredible opportunity a couple of years back at, at one of my cousin's weddings to speak with Tim's kids who were just babies at the time that that happened. And uh, having the opportunity to speak with them and just, A, express my gratitude for what their father did, yeah. but B, also tell them a little bit about the legacy that he's left, whether he intended to or not. I mean, it's just really, really powerful stuff. So, um, you know, rest in peace, Tim, but, you know, everything that you're... that that you did or were about, you know, I'm trying to share that with the world. What are some specific ways you encourage people to find lessons and, and tragedies? Oh man. So the first thing, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, is that you have to be curious. Yeah. I think it's critical to anything, any pursuit in life. And if, if you're looking for lessons in the tragedies, uh, you know, a lot of times I think it can be hard to, well, A, just going through a tragedy on its own is hard. But yeah. reflecting, thinking about it, uh, journaling, like all those different practices that really help your mind, you know, wrap your mind around what happened can be can be hard to start. But I think it's much easier as you go on. So my first encouragement is to be curious about what actually happened. Ask questions, re- reminisce, think about it. Like, don't run from it. And if it's hard to bring it back up, it doesn't mean you have to think about it all day for, for you know, or for hours at a time. Start small, you know? I- Five minutes, start there. And uh, second thing, and I mentioned journaling, but writing things down. I think writing things down is absolutely critical. I can't tell you uh, how many lessons in my life have been learned by reading or like reminiscing about the same thing that I've thought about before, but it just hits you a different way at the right moment. Um, And so if you write things down, you're much more likely to come back to them and read read about it again. Okay. But that that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, um, when you when someone is struggling or, or having a difficult time, um, how 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 can they see the blessings in this situation though? Yeah, well, I don't want to say that yeah, there's no catch-all solution to this, but I will tell you one of the things that helped me, and I did not even realize it while I was it was going on. Um, but I've reminisced about this with my cousin now, and I, I mentioned he suffers from cystic fibrosis, which is a rest respiratory, digestive, reproductive disease. It's, you know, it's very, very, uh, you know, depleting disorder. And they, they've come a long way. I mean, thank God that he's still alive, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, married now with a kid and, and thriving well because of the work of the foundation and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, praise God for that. But 
what I think is key when you talk about, you know, like in relation to your question is it's not necessarily about like in the moment that things are happening. I mean, it's very, very hard. You know, you, you can't paw the tragedy to figure out what's good about it. Right. Right. Well, no, I can't. I don't know if I have a solution. In fact, I will be honest. I don't have a solution for anyone who's, who's right in the middle. Like when you, when it flicks that it's an unexpected tragedy, I don't expect you to stop. And so I remember Bob told me to do this. Like that's, that's not a solution that I right. have. Right. Um, but what I do have is you have to lean into the, the resources that you have in those moments because, you know, I used to think that my, my cousin was annoying and it, not in like a, I hate him, like I don't like him or would, would not want to be around type of way, but in like, you know, he's my younger, like eight, yeah. 10 years younger than me cousin. Like he's just, mm-hmm. he's just annoying. Yeah. And he would wake me up at like six in the morning, like the day after chemotherapy treatment to like play video games. Mm-hmm. And, um, he would be bugging me like. And I used to think, I was like, man, like, just let me sleep or, you know, leave me alone for five minutes. Like a younger sibling. Yeah, exactly. The sibling that I never had because I'm an only child. Mm-hmm. And um, my my parents gave up after me. They're like, that's <laughs> enough. Um, but it's critical to think about this because he was just being himself and being friendly and, and, and wanted to enjoy spending time with his, his older cousin. And I didn't realize it at the time, but... Even though it felt annoying initially, that camaraderie we developed, we and sometimes it was wallowing in our sorrows. I mean, I was like throwing up and sick because I was taking chemo and he was packing up stuff and taking medication because he was dealing with his respiratory disorder. I mean, there were some dark moments. Yeah. When we were sitting there, like we sat down to play video games, but we couldn't even play video games because we were so sick. Wow. And it was like, and I thought, in my mind at the time, it always started off as being an annoyance. But when we went back and reminisced a couple, man, it was almost two years ago now, I think we recorded this podcast, but we had this conversation that we had never really had like in, to, with each other. And we had it recorded on a podcast. And it, I came to the realization that, and he had figured out that our parents were in caboose. Like my uncle and my aunt were telling my mom and dad, like, how can we get them to like help each other? And they encouraged him. They're like, yeah, go wake him up. You know, and he's going to say, he's going to say, let me go back to sleep, but build a bond together. Right. So you ask the question, like, while people are in tragedy, you know, what can help you get through? And I say, it's lean into those people that care about you and want to be with you. And it's such a powerful force. So my cousin and my other, other family members really, really helped me during that time. And I look back at that. I'm like, wow, without them, I, I can't imagine what I would have been. Not, I mean, I was a physical wreck to begin with. But mentally, I went off the deep end if I didn't have that connection with people in my family. Yeah, the support, the support, definitely. Mm-hmm. That that's that's important. Um, how do you approach spreading your message and inspiring others on a larger scale? Well, I, I have a saying that I heard at a concert when I was younger, and it was another one of those things that at the time it didn't really hit me, but now I realize it. And that is the, you know, the, the artist, the lead singer of this band set up there and he said, you may not change the world, but you may change the world for one. In other words, we're all not going to be, you know, multi continent, you know, famous yeah. motivational speaker or, you know, influencer type of thing. We're all not going to have a gazillion followers on Instagram or something. Uh, but every single person out there has gifts and skills that they can make someone else's world better. And that's the way I approach it. You know, I listen to some people out there in the, you know, internet, social media sphere, and they talk about, and I believe me, I love goals and I appreciate aggressive goals. So they'll say, yeah. my goal is to teach a billion people about how to sell necklaces online and whatever it is their product, loans, you service they're serving, they're selling. It's I'm going to reach a billion people. And God bless me and the mission and generosity and overcoming things. If we can reach a billion people, I think that is tremendous. Um, But I don't put a number on it like that. The way I approach it is I try to take all of the smaller opportunities that I have and capitalize on as many of them as possible because I think the consistency is a much more stronger and powerful force than just one or two big events. Okay. Okay. Are, Are there any specific projects or initiatives you are currently working on to further your mission? Yes. Uh, there, well, there's two that I can think of. One is the podcast. I love speaking. I love talking. It's called Speaking of Impact. And I love talking with other people who have a similar mindset and uh, people who have built something 
for impact, whether that's a nonprofit organization or even a for-profit company, but they've built it with the intention of helping other people in some way or another. Uh, and usually they've overcome something and that's enabled them to figure out a system to be able to do this. So yes, that's the podcast. And now I'm really, really trying to speak to as many organizations as possible. Um, I mentioned my broadcasting career previously. Well, my career in the financial industry had prevented me for many years for compliance reasons of doing a lot of media appearances and speaking in a lot of right. places. Um, but uh, I've since opened my own company now about a, two and a half years ago, me and my business partner. So now my initiative is to get out there and do speaking. So if you're an organization, large or small, if you're a company that's looking to build cultures of generosity in your organization, uh, I'm your guy. I have a keynote, a couple of keynote addresses uh, that will help your organization build this collaborative culture. And I call it radical generosity equals radical growth. Ooh, radical generosity equals radical growth. I like that. I like that. Good. good. I'm glad. <laughs> well, before we close, uh, this is one of the questions I like to ask everyone uh, on my podcast. Okay. What are you grateful for? Oh, I appreciate it. So can I just say that a friend of mine started calling uh, gratitude vitamin G. So... Anytime I get this question, I talk about vitamin G. So vitamin and, G, okay. Anyone out there can steal it. Make sure you get your vitamin G uh, every day. And the number one thing I'm grateful for, Sheila, is life here uh, because I almost lost it at 18. Yeah. So um, yeah. I have my gratitude practice is not extravagant. You know, I think there's some people that have, like we talk about journaling or writing things on the wall or, mm. um, you know, or talking about announcing it. Some people, I, some people I know who they say the words and the things they're grateful for. And I believe in that. I, you know, my wife and I, we also pray about this too. So there's lots of practices and many of them are probably uh, more time consuming and complicated than mine, but mine is very, very, very simple. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I'm thankful that I woke up. So simple. But before I do anything, before I check my phone, or even before I use the bathroom, get a drink, what roll out of bed, anything. I open my eyes and I'm like, thank God I'm alive. And that alone, I am telling you, I know this might seem uh I told you I don't exaggerate anything. Totally true. That alone really gives me great perspective for every day. Does it make every day perfect? No, but it makes me realize that just the opportunity to get out of bed, you can do what I do. It's such a blessing. It's a blessing. That's 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 so true because, you know, there's a lot of people who don't have that opportunity, you know, so we have to be thankful. And uh, I appreciate I, I appreciate you, Bob. I thank you for coming on and and sharing your story. And again, let my listeners know where they can, if you know, your website, they, where they can reach out to you. I know you, you you wrote a book, right? Is that the book behind you, Personal? Yeah, yeah, that is. That is my book, uh, Personal Finance in a Public World. It, it's it's book about out. digital ads, social media, and how that affects our money decisions. So, okay. Uh, and there's a Twitch that. Okay. What's your website again? It's BobDePasquale.com. You can you can find the podcast, the book, my social handles, my DMs are always open. Everything's on BobDePasquale.com. Well, Bob, your story serves as a powerful reminder that even in the face of adversity, we have the ability to create positive change. And it has been an honor to have you on my podcast. And I hope that you continue spreading your message of hope and impact and generosity. I, I really do. And I thank you so much for taking the opportunity to uh, just stop by and share your story and your journey. And I, I was Grecian. incredibly grateful for the opportunity, Sheila. Thank you so much. And, and, and best of luck with the continued mission that you're on. Thank you so much. Join me next time where I will continue to discuss more of today's issues. You can hit me up on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube or email me at sheilas take at outlook.com for topics you would like to discuss or if you would like to be a guest on Sheila's Take. I am your host, Sheila Dunbar. Blessings to you.